three, two, one. Oh my gosh. This is Maverick, an advanced flight computer that I spent a month designing and even longer testing. You see, I make rockets. No, not that. Well, sort of. More like this. Or this. An actively controlled model rocket. Think SC's rockets, but the next level. The way it works is pretty simple. By gimbling the thrust to the point where you want, you can stabilize the rocket in the same way you would balance a broomstick. This is called thrust vector control, or TVC for short. But how does the rocket know where it is, where to go, and control itself? What's the brains behind it? That, of course, is a flight computer. Unsurprisingly, it's one of the most important components in having a successful flight. Having the better sensors, faster processors, etc. can be the difference between this and this. So if I finally want to have a successful TVC rocket, I need to make sure I have a good flight computer. But how do I do that? Well, to look forward, let's first look back on my first flight computer, EVA. For the most part, this board was great, but there were a few key issues. One, I forgot pull-up resistors on the I2C lines. If you don't know why that's bad, here's a quick rundown. The pins on the microcontroller, the tiny brain, have a couple different ways of generating signals. In the I2C communication protocol, to register zero, they're pulled down to ground, but to register one, they're left floating, which is why you need to pull up the line. That way, when floating, it pulls up to one. This is really important. I was able to sort of get around this in software, but I ran into a lot of data integrity issues. Two, there was zero labeling anywhere, which made testing a pain. Three, it required an external bootloader, which could only be purchased from a specific distributor, making sourcing components way harder than it needed to be. And four, aesthetics-wise, it left something to be desired. So I knew for my next, I needed some serious upgrades. The biggest being the switch to the STM32F4 microcontroller. Although it's slightly slower than the one used in EVA, it doesn't require external bootloaders, is more configurable, and is much more widely used. I also chose newer sensors, added positioning, and made it look really, really cool. Just wait. To compensate for the slight hit in processing speed, I also switched to SPI for sensor communication. It's faster for a number of reasons which I'm not going to get into, but if you're interested, I linked a great video in the description. With the requirements and components set, I then began designing the schematic of the board. Think of this as a blueprint detailing all the connections, a guide of sorts for routing. I then moved on to component placement. This took a couple days to get right, partly for aesthetics, but also because a quality of layout will make your life a hundred times easier when it comes time for the next step, routing. This is where you actually define the copper traces that connect all your components together. It's kind of like creating roads to connect all of your little buildings, and it can be very therapeutic. But also, sometimes not. Just take a look at this. Yeah, that was a mess. I would not recommend doing a BGA on a four layer board. Anyways, at this point, version one was done. I made the order, and a month later, the boards arrived. These look amazing. Hmm. I wonder who made them. PCB Way, of course, the sponsor of today's video. They offer CNC machining, sheet metal fab, 3D printing, injection molding, and you guessed it, PCBs. This was my first time using their PCB and assembly service, and it was wicked easy. Just upload your files, configure, then submit. Their team is also super knowledgeable and even caught a couple mistakes that I missed. And if you sign up right now with the link below, you'll get $5 of free new user credit. Wow. Now back to the board. With these in hand, let's finally talk specs. Again, the main processor is an STM32F4. This clocks in at 180 megahertz, which should be way more than needed. Now for sensors. The IMU is an ICM42688P, chosen for high precision and low noise. I actually found it through an awesome video from Jacob Thornhill on his flight computer for a fin-controlled rocket. Check it out in the description. Because it's a sixth off IMU, I also have an external magnetometer for absolute orientation, and the barometer sits right next to it. Positioning is what makes this board special. Instead of the typical GPS for location, I'm using ultra wideband technology to triangulate position up to 50 times faster. Originally, I was actually going to use GPS and even design the whole board around it. However, when I started to dig deeper, I became worried about the low accuracy and update rate, especially when it came to landing a rocket. That's when I came across ultra wideband. The way it works is super cool. By sending a pulse signal to a ground station and measuring the time of flight, you can find the distance between transmitter and receiver. And with a couple ground stations at known positions, you can triangulate your current position. Now you're probably wondering, that sounds great, why doesn't everyone use it instead of GPS? 
Unfortunately, it also has a limited range and depends on your objects being in line of sight. So for orbital rockets, it won't work, but for my low and slow TVC rocket, it hopefully should. But given this uncertainty, I'm planning on using the first launch to test feasibility. The way I'll be testing this is by using a single Maverick board as a ground station and logging the calculated distance during flight. Because I'll know the altitude of the rocket from the barometer and the approximate distance to the launch pad, I can calculate the estimated distance and see if it's within the ballpark. My main concern is the radiation pattern of the antenna. Generally, these devices are meant to measure within the same plane as the ground stations, which might make it inaccurate when you're 20 plus meters in the air. This could be fixed by switching to my own antenna, but brings a ton of other complexities that I'm hoping to avoid. Again, this is why I'm testing it. Now let's talk IO. Starting in the bottom right, we have the switch for board power, and above it sits the battery input, which has reverse polarity protection. Because flight is a high vibration environment and could potentially cause the switch to flip mid-flight, above it I have an external bypass switch for flight. Right next to it is Pyro Channel 1. All of the pyros have continuity detection and are controlled via an N-channel MOSFET on the low side, which is a somewhat suboptimal choice. In the future, I would use a high side switch to reduce the risk of shorting the high side to ground, and also a fuse to protect the PCB from a dead short. Moving on, our 3.3 volt output, UR output, the boot switch for the SCM32, the main LED, a lower transceiver for live telemetry, DC motor feedback or CAN, a USB-C connection for talking to the computer, a 5 volt output, a battery output, power channel 3, an I2C sensor connection, potentially for things like LiDAR, a motor driver connector for things like a reaction wheel, four servo connectors, and power channel 2. And on the back side, we have a buzzer, a micro SD card slot for offloading data after flight, a flash chip for logging data during flight, and a 5 volt 8 amp buck converter. This board is meant to be powered by 7.4 volt 2's LiPo, which powers the pyros and a 5 volt 8 amp buck regulator. This supplies the servos, 5 volt output, and of course the 3.3 volt low dropout regulator, which feeds the microcontroller and all of the sensors. Before talking about testing, the actual board is four layers with a power signal, ground, ground, power signal, stack up, and was designed in Altium Designer. It's about 1.6 millimeters thick and has one ounce copper layers. Now for the moment of truth. Does it work? Let's do this. Three, two, one. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. It didn't blow up, let's go. However, not everything was perfect. Wait a minute, that doesn't seem right. The board is on, but the power switch is off. What gives? So after a whole lot of testing and a little bit of help, I finally determined the issue to be a flipped MOSFET, which is essentially just an electronic switch. These electronic switches are really only meant to block current flow in one direction when open, which means that if they're flipped, even if the switch is technically open, a small amount of current will still flow. As a result, my on-off switch is now just an on-less-on switch. Yeah, but what about the rest of the board? To test this, I wrote a short program with my previous flight software to map orientation to thrust vector mount angle, which will allow me to actually examine the core purpose of this computer, controlling a rocket. And if you want to know more about my thrust vector mount, lucky you, I made a video about it. Check it in the description. And now for the test. Safe to say, this thing rocks. Now for the final question, would you buy it? I'm open to doing a production run of these boards once I've fixed the bugs, so if you're interested, let me know by filling out the form below. If you want to follow this progress in real time so you don't have to wait forever between uploads and gain access to the CAD of what I build, I'd highly, highly recommend checking out my Patreon, link in description. Thanks for watching. See you in the next.